Good evening, everybody. At our last meeting, we concluded our discussion of topic one, the nature of Jewish ethics. And we're ready tonight to move to topic two on human nature. But before we move there, I'd like to know if you have any questions or observations about what we discussed so far, because a lot of stuff was thrown at you, and I don't know how well it's been digested. If any of you got indigestion. Please. I have a question about why we decided to, uh, I mean, I intuitively understand why we decided the rational wasn't enough for ethics, but if you just say a couple sentences on why that, why we decided that didn't work. Hold it for later when we okay. talk about human nature, because it ties in with that too. Any, anything else? Okay. Please. Well, I don't know if it's relevant, but uh, we'll find out. Made in the image of God and that We're going to discuss it. that tonight at some length. Oh, that too. Yes, women, not only men, but women too, as you'll see. You wait long enough, you see everything, right? Now, every system of ethics rests upon an understanding of the nature of the human being. Ethics deals with behavior toward the self and toward others and considers certain kinds of behavior morally correct and other kinds of behavior morally incorrect. But underlying the question of which actions toward the self and toward others are morally correct or incorrect is the question of what is the nature of the self and what is the nature of the others, namely other human beings, toward which this behavior is directed. And I think you'll agree, if you think about it, that different understandings of the nature of the human being lead you inevitably to different moral systems regarding how to treat the self as a human being and how to treat other human beings. So in further dealing with the question that we discussed at the end of our last meeting, namely of why be moral, the question of why to treat ourselves and others in a certain way, and why certain ways are not considered correct, we must therefore consider the nature of being human, namely human nature. The question of why be moral, which we discussed last time, is not answered completely unless we first deal with the question of human nature. The question of what is human about a human being. Because the issues of why to be ethical and how to be ethical presumes a certain understanding of human nature. For example, if we were to say that a human being is a being without free will. If we say human nature means that human beings have no free will, if we take this view of human nature, then the question is how does that apply in expectations for ethical behavior? Because if we say that a human being is a being without free will, a human being is a being without the possibility of moral choice, and everything is predetermined, then how can we expect a human being to then be responsible for the consequences of moral choice? So you see that how you view the nature of the human being has a direct effect on what kind of moral expectations you can have from the human being. In other words, underlying, as I said before, underlying each system of ethics there is either explicitly or implicitly a notion of the nature of the human being. Or, for example, if we say that the human being is a being con completely controlled by instinct, how then can we expect certain kind of actions of the human being that are anti-instinctual? Like, for example, certain things that we often identify with moral virtue, such as altruism, or generosity, 
or humility because if the human being is controlled by certain instincts that do not make them altruistic but rather selfish or do not make them generous but rather acquisitive or do not make them humble but rather proud then how can we say that we can expect the human being to develop these kinds of moral virtues if the human being is totally controlled by instincts that are against it. Or, for example, if we have a view, which some societies in our century have had, that the human being has no individual nature, that the human being is simply a cog in a huge social machine and is expected to uh, fill out their behavior by conforming to the norms of society imposed by that big social machine, then how can we expect certain moral behavior from a person? Here, for example, you have the defense that the great, the, I shouldn't say the great, the infamous Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann had at his trial. He said, I was just a cog in a big machine and I was just following the norms of the society, which happened to be Nazi Germany, and therefore I was doing uh, what was morally right, not what was morally wrong, and how can you be prosecuting me for this? So I would suggest then that the nature of the human being, or what in Europe is very often called philosophical anthropology, namely the philosophical views on the nature of the human being is the key to understanding any ethical system and that therefore an understanding of the nature of the human being according to Judaism is obviously the key to understanding the foundation upon which Jewish ethics uh, rests. Now before discussing what is the view or are the views of human nature in Jewish sources, I want first to review some other views of the nature of the human being that have developed in the history of Western philosophy and thought. And I think to make a rather complicated issue, not simpli simplistic, but I hope simplified, I would suggest that if you went through the entire history of Western thought, say for the last maybe 3,000 years, you would find that essentially three views on the nature of the human being uh, have developed. And for one of better, pardon me? Non-Jewish views in the history of Western uh, philosophy. I'm leaving aside, say, Christianity, just let's take Western philosophy, three views. And for want of better term, I like to call the first view the zoological view, the second view the mechanistic view, and the third view the economic view. Now, I call the first view the zoological view because this approach begins with the assumption that the human be zoon means animal in Greek. And this approach begins with the assumption that the human being is an animal. And the question then becomes, what kind of animal is the human being? And how is the human being then differentiated from other animals that make it distinct and unique and that give us certain moral expectations that we have of the human being that we don't have of, moral, uh, of uh, other animals. Then, beginning as we'll see in around the 17th century, a second approach develops, sort of to replace the zoological view, though not completely. And that is the view of the human being as a variety of machine. Because in the 17th century, you have the idea that the machine is sort of the ideal thing. That the universe is a big machine, everything is a machine, so why shouldn't the human being be a machine? 
And the question then becomes, if the human being is a machine, how is the human machine different, say, from other machines? Put it rather crassly, say, how are you different from a clock or a watch? They were very big in the 17th century on, on clocks, because they were very precision to very uh, made with high precision. And then you have uh, coming in our in the 19th century, but developing even more in our own century, an economical uh, economic approach, which sees the human being as a variety of economic commodity. And then the question becomes, how is the human commodity different than any other commodity? Say, different than a car, or different than a refrigerator, or something like this. Now, before looking at these three approaches found in Western thought, we have to establish some criteria for evaluating them once we put them on the table. And I'd like to suggest three criteria for evaluating these three views, which I'll then outline and then we'll critique. First of all, when we deal with the question of what is human nature, or with the question, as the philosophers would put it, of defining a human being, we're involved in a different kind of exercise than we're involved in, say, when we're discussing, say, the definition of a chair or the nature of a chair. Because as far as we know, unless chairs talk to you, maybe you know better, <laughs> as far as we know, the chair doesn't really care how we define it. The chair doesn't really care what its nature is. But, if you give a human being a definition of the human being, it's a definition of them. And they care how you're defining them. Because there are implications of that definition in terms, for instance, of how you're going to treat them. Or of how they're going to think about themselves. So if you define a human being in a certain way, it's a question that is of great importance to yourself. And you have the right to veto that definition or that idea of what the nature of the human being is because it's, in effect, something that impacts on yourself. So that's criteria one. Is this notion, whatever it is, of the nature of the human being acceptable to me as a human being. So when we deal with the different definitions that come out of these three approaches, one question you have to ask yourself is, it may sound good, but do I want to be defined that way? If you're a chair and you're defining a chair, big deal. But in this case, you have to think about that. The second criteria to think about as we go through these is to think about these definitions not simply in terms of the definition itself but in terms of their moral implications. In other words, while the definition may seem very intriguing or may seem even correct logically or descriptively or whatever, what are the moral implications of that definition? How does that definition play out when you come to applying it to certain moral behavior? And I'll give you some examples of this as we go. And then I would suggest also a third criteria. Have any of you studied philosophy? Oh, more than I expect. If you studied philosophy, or even if you go to boring managerial meetings, <laughs> you know that one thing people are always looking for are definitions, right? Philosophers are always trying to define everything, 
and you're always sitting in a meeting and somebody says something nobody understands and you say define your terms and they never can and nobody knows what's going on. <laughs> but the approach of Western philosophy, and I would say the approach of Western thought generally is definitional. In other words, you want to know what the thing is. And as soon as you say what the thing is, you're asking for two things. In Latin, any of you know Latin? The word for what? is essay. So you say what is the whatness of something. What makes it what it is, we have from that the English word essence. The essence is the whatness of it. What is it that makes it what it is? So we have this proclivity in Western thought to look for the essence of things, the whatness of things, and secondly we have a proclivity to define everything. If you look at this proclivity from a, say, Eastern cultural point of view, it's very bizarre. In other words, from an Eastern view, you would say these Westerners have two strange proclivity. I would translate proclivity in Yiddish, if you know Yiddish, as mishagas. <laughs> and the, 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 the strange proclivities are, number one, that they want to define everything. And number two, once they define it, they think they know what it is. But Eastern is another business. We'll get to it another time. But the word define comes from de fine, which means of limits. In other words, to, when you define something, you're immediately limiting it you're immediately circumscribing that thing from other things. You're cutting it off. You're saying this is not that. So when we're dealing with attempts to define the human being, or even to define a chair, we have to ask ourselves whether it meets the criteria for definition, which are that it tells you the essence of the thing, tells you what it is, that it shows you the limits between this thing and other things, but more important, that as a good definition, it defines that thing, whatever it is, say a chair, not only in terms of this chair, but in terms of all chairs. All chairs that are were and ever will be, have to fit that definition. Because if you have an exception to that definition, then your definition uh, isn't really good. Or to put it in the form of, of the, say, the way a, a logician would put it, all chairs are a member of the class of chairs. And when you define a chair, you are defining all members of that class, whoever were, are, or will be. So when you define a human being, which is a little more difficult than defining a chair, you have to come up with a definition which to be valid and meet the criteria of definition have to apply to all human beings, whoever were, are, or will be. So with these three criteria, we'll take a look now at attempts in the history of Western thought to define the human being, beginning with the zoological. The zoological approach is first found in Plato. You all heard of Plato, right? Right. I'm not talking about the computer program named Plato. <laughs> I'm not talking about Plato. I'm talking about the philosopher Plato, right? You all heard of him. Now, in one of the Platonic dialogues, Socrates is involved with trying to come up with some definition of a human being. So he goes to his friend, and he says to his friend, give me a definition. What do you think? And his friend says, the human being is a kind of animal. So 
zoological view. Human being is a kind of animal. Socrates says, fine, I agree. But what kind? What? What is the essence of the human being? What <coughs> distinguishes the human being from other animals? So his friend says, human being is a biped. Namely, a dog has four legs, a cow has four legs, a rhinoceros has four legs, but a human being has two. So, Socrates says, thank you very much for this definition. Comes back the next day, and he goes back to his friend, and he says to his friend, look here in my hand, I have a human being according to your definition. His friend looks in his Socrates hand and he sees there a chicken. <laughs> so his friend says, what are you talking about? This is a chicken. He says, not according to your definition. According to your definition, the human being is a biped animal, an animal with two feet. So is this. So therefore, Either a chicken is a human being, or maybe a human being is a kind of chicken, but your definition has some problems. So his friend says, okay, I was right, a human being is a biped, but the definition needs a little refinement. So Socrates says, okay, so refine it. His friend thinks a minute, he says, okay, I got it. Human being is a featherless biped. <laughs> In other words, the chicken, the turkey, the bird, the this, the sparrow, the parakeet, they have feathers. Human beings don't have feathers. So that's the difference. Socrates says, excuse me for a minute, goes to the back of the house, all of a sudden you hear a lot of bird noise, squawking, this, that. <laughs> Socrates comes back, pulled out all the feathers. Holds up the chicken without the feathers. And he says, so here's your human being. <laughs> Featherless biped, just like you said. His friend says, well, I think our definition needs still a little more refinement. He thinks a minute and he says, okay, I got it. A human being is a featherless biped with straight nails. The chickens have curled nails <laughs> with straight nails. So I don't know if they went to the manicurist or it doesn't say in the Platonic Dialogues. But the point is, they didn't come to any definition. And the bigger point is, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be defined as a featherless biped with <laughs> flat nails. So in Plato, you don't really come to a very good definition. Then comes Plato's disciple, Aristotle. And in Aristotle's writings, we encounter two major definitions of the human being. One of them we already encountered last time, and that is Plato's definition, uh, Aristotle's definition of the human being as the rational animal. In other words, what the human being is an animal but what differentiates the human being from other animals is that the human being has a rational faculty, as he would say, in the soul, and other animals don't have this. We have other faculties in the soul, other things that other animals have, but only the human being has the rational faculty. And one of the results of the fact that the human being has the rational faculty where other animals don't is that human beings util, util, utilize this rational faculty to speak. So another way of saying it, and you have this very strongly in medieval, Jewish, in medieval philosophy, but in, certainly in medieval Jewish philosophy, is that the human being can be defined as the speaking animal because the human being has the power to speak, because he has the rational uh, faculty of the soul. As a matter of fact, in many medieval Hebrew philosophical texts, 
The term used there for human being is the Hebrew term hamadaber, which simply means the one who speaks. Human being is the speaking animal. Now, is there any problem with this definition? Slightly? Well, pardon me? Slightly, so give me why. Tell me why. Well, a parrot can uh, mimic. It, it does have the reasoning, but it can mimic the speech. All right, that's one. I see some more problems here. Some people can't speak. That's exactly it. And this gets to the second, our second criteria, the moral implications. If you define the human being as the animal who can speak, the implication is that a person who can't speak is not a human being. And therefore, this is, wrong. this is a bad definition. It's a bad definition, but therefore, if the person who can't speak is not a human being, therefore, the person is an animal. And therefore, they're treated like an animal. So therefore, say, if you kill them, it's not murder anymore. So if you want to buy that, go ahead. But I don't think you do. People who can't speak are called dumb, which sounds it's very nice. Whether it's very nice or not is another thing. But if you can use it as a justify to kill somebody, it's another business. Say in the Nazi euthanasia program, they took people who had certain disabilities and defined them as useless mouths to feed. <coughs> so if you're a useless or lives not worthy of living. So if you're a useless mouth to feed, life not worthy of living, it's not any more a crime to, to kill you because then you're a subhuman. How, how did Aristotle define a, a newborn baby? A newborn baby is a, is a human being with the potential to speak. So for him, it's no problem. If that baby has the potential and actualizes that potential, uh, it's no problem. But if the, human, if the newborn baby doesn't have the potential to speak, say because it's born with certain, some kind of problem, then he would say it's not uh, a human baby. It's some kind of uh, animal baby or something like this. Now, of course, you know, for Aristotle, he went even further. I didn't want to get into it. But when he meant speak, he meant speak Greek. <laughs> Another issue. But I didn't want to get into that. Yeah. In your uh, criteria that you're going to use, this one that you uh, are currently stressing, namely that you like the definition, uh, why don't you require it also to be accurate? For example, you describe somebody and you characterize their views as being uh, ill-informed. Maybe perfectly accurate, the person may not like it, but uh, could well be correct. Well, I'm, I'm all for it being accurate and I'm all being for it being correct. The question is who sets the criteria for accuracy and correctness? You want to make it anthropomorphic, huh? You got to like it to like it. No, I don't want to make it anthropomorphic. I just want to make it fill these criteria. If you want to add some other criteria, it's fine with me. Now, last week when we discussed the rational view of ethics, some of you raised some objections to that, which would apply here too, which is your issue. Namely, is it accurate? Is it accurate to say that the human being is a rational animal? No. No. Why not? Because many people act irrational. Many? <laughs> well, Freud's argument was that the irrational is the basis of human nature, not the rational. And I told you, I think, about what Bertrand Russell said, that he accepted Aristotle's definition, but he never met a rational human <laughs> being. And then somebody raised the issue that uh, in different societies, what is rational is viewed differently. So even if you accepted the definition of the human being as the rational animal, what you would say me rational means in different societies 
is a different thing, or at different time periods is a different thing. Now, the Stoic philosophers added another uh, issue in the hopper. They said, not only is the human being the rational animal, but what makes the human being the rational animal is the human being's ability, or at least potentiality, doesn't always reach it, to strain out the emotions. In other words, one of the terms for the emotions was the term pathos. Some of you even are, are arguing today that pathos or empathy is the basis of all morality, but I don't want to get into that. And the Stoics argued that to remove pathos, to be A without pathos, is what allows the person to attain the state of being rational. In other words, that there's the emotions and there's the rational. And the way you manifest the rational is by straining out the emotions, the pathos. And therefore, to be rational is to be without pathos or apathetic. Because the emotions mess up the ability to think and act rationally. And therefore, to think and act rationally, you have to strain out all of the emotions. So it's not simply when you say the human being is the rational animal, at least from the Stoic point of view, you're not simply saying something that the human being is claimed to be, you're also saying something about what the human being is claimed that they shouldn't be. So even if you're willing to buy the definition of the human being as a rational animal, if you accept this approach, that means you also accept the approach that rational means a complete negation of the emotions. So there's a flip side to this definition that is also, in my view, um, problematic. Which is pretty much the definition of contemporary, the term rational. I mean, it's, it's always that. You're not thinking rationally. Yes, it's a very contemporary, or, or I would even go one step further and give you the management. See, there's always a, a management a, a language for this stuff. And that I find to be the term professional. <laughs> Act professionally. The uh, economist uh, definition of discord is an irrational passion for dispassionate rationality. Something like that. That's good. Now, Aristotle's second definition of the human being as a kind of animal is uh, very well known. And that is I don't spell well in any language, but it's something like this. The zoon politicus. The political animal or better translation would be the social animal. Namely, that what makes the human being different than other animals is that human beings are political animals. They live in political units. They live in societies. What do you think about that? Bees, bees live in society. Right. So you'd say, well, Human beings are not the only animals that live in organized societies. Bees also live in organized societies. Ants, even better. And since the society of the bees and the ants is certainly more organized than our chaotic society, therefore, bees and ants are more human than we are. That's possible. Pardon me? <laughs> And I don't think might, but uh, okay. Certainly would resent it. Which is the third criteria, if they were rational. If they were rational, I guess. I don't know. And what is about the moral implication uh, issue here? Just the alone, they're not 
That's one moral implication. If somebody was an individual, they would be outside of the moral scope. Right. Everybody should do the same thing because they're a social animal at the end. Right. They have no moral choice. They have their assigned roles in the ant society or the bee society. They don't make decisions. They just do what their, you know, genetic programming is. All right, well, you've just blown away about um, 500 or 1,000 uh, years of uh, speculation already. Now, one thing I left out here, and that is when Aristotle is talking about defining the human being here, he is not talking about all human beings. Men, Men only. So here's a problem. Now that he came up with the definition of men, and is it only men? Only Greek men. Others are barbarians. So they're subhuman, sub-Greek. See, that's another tactic that many have used in the history of thought. Namely, you define your group as the human beings, and everybody else is something else. That's what many cultures, including our own, have used to justify killing other people, say, in war. You define the enemy in some kind of subhuman way, and therefore it's not really murder. Now, Aristotle then had this problem, what do we do about women? He couldn't accept this idea that they were uh, rational. Couldn't accept the idea they were social. But they have some similarities with men. But there were certain distinguishing differences. Any of you know what his definition was? Yeah, didn't you say there was something like imperfect men? Or something? He said it a, more, a little more bluntly. He said, women are castrated men. See why Aristotle is not a favorite of feminists. <laughs> now, in the 18th century, late 18th century, another version of this zoological definition becomes very popular. It's used by no one less than uh, Benjamin Franklin. And in the 19th century, by Karl Marx. I said, well, we don't like the definitions of the past, but certainly the human being is a kind of animal. What kind of animal? They said, a tool-making animal. What distinguishes the human being from other kinds of animals is the ability to make tools. That's what makes a human being human. See any problems with that one? Pardon me, otters? Well, probably better because I can make a dam for sure. My life depended on it. <laughs> oh, those are, what do otters do? Otters, they use, they use uh, implements to break open uh, shells. Uh huh. They're used for fur coats. They break open shells. I know, so they're not kosher, for sure. <laughs> they don't have a kosher diet, for sure. They're not Jewish. <laughs> not Jewish. It could be reformed. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're reform otters. I don't know what kind of otters they are. But. All right, so if a uh, tool-making animal, they're also tool-making. And some of them are more adept at tool-making than we are. Any other problems with this? Well, it takes you right into primates. Takes you what? Right into primates. All, the primates All right, so then we, it, has, it doesn't... It, uh, accomplish this. It doesn't differentiate us from a lot of them. Any other problems? Uh, 
All right, suppose you consider, say, a nuclear device as a tool. A nuclear device aimed at blowing up a lot of people. And you happen to be walking down the streets in India and you meet Mother Teresa. And you say to her, how good are you at making nuclear devices? Says, I have no idea how to make a nuclear device. So would you say then that she is less human than a person who makes a nuclear device ready to blow up uh, Chicago or something like this? That's also problematic. What's the problem? Well, you know, for definition, the ability to make tools, and you haven't gone and said then the greater the tool, the greater the humanity in that definition. That's, now, right. that's what you're going with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's implied. It doesn't have to be implied. I mean, it doesn't have to, maybe it is by the author, but it doesn't, I don't see it has to be. Well, suppose you had a human being who couldn't make tools, as opposed to another human being that only makes tools of destruction then you would have to say that one is human and the other isn't. So this is a very sensitive point with me because my, I don't know how to work a computer. <laughs> I don't know how, I simply, I'm afraid to turn this thing on, I'm afraid that I won't know how to turn it off, I'll erase everything, it'll explode, something like this. And my son makes fun of me all the time. My wife makes fun of me all the time. My colleagues here make fun of me all the time. It's a pleasure to have tenure, isn't it? So I, you know, I said to him, look, you see this fountain pen? This is my whole technology. I don't need this computer. But so they say, star, it doesn't star information. no, I have this. It doesn't go down to as often as the computers. And you didn't need to make the pen, you bought it. I bought the pen, but, you know, they say, well, you know, you should write with a, write with a computer. I said, well, look, I'll make you a deal. When you write 20 books, when you publish 20 books, come back, and then I'll start writing with a computer. <laughs> I published 20 books with this pen, writing with this pen. I don't need a computer. That's no, I, that's the whole point. <laughs> so by this definition, I would not be a human being. You're not a human being. Right. Light bulbs for me is it, why, why and not you always. Find something without one exception. Because if because by definition, definition is all examples of that thing. That's what a definition is. If you want to make a generalization, we can make a generalization. But a generalization is not a definition, and philosophers, which is who we're talking about, were into definitions. They weren't into generalizations. You know, I forgot who it was said, I think Winston Churchill, who said, all generalizations are wrong, including this one. <laughs> so I'm dealing with the way they're approaching it. You know, generalizations you can make. But generalizations are dangerous. I'm just waiting to see where you find the definition. Oh, you'll be very, you'll be very surprised. You'll be very, no, I'm not finding it there. No, you'll be surprised. <laughs> All right, so these are just some examples of the zoological stretching a period of almost 3,000 years. Now, in the 17th century, you begin to see a new approach developing, not excluding the old approach. The old approach is still around today. You hear it today all the time, human being as a kind of animal. Now, you heard of the philosopher Descartes, <coughs> not a la carte, Descartes. <laughs> Descartes, <laughs> pardon me? No, 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 that was Aristotle. No, no. Descartes is, I think, therefore I am. That's Descartes. He locked himself up in an oven in Holland to come up with this. Would you believe this? He thought this up, I think, therefore I am, while sitting in an oven in an inn in Holland. Pardon me? That's, that's a fact. It's a fact, yeah. It's a fact. Yeah, but would Aristotle consider like he was a rational human being? For sitting in the oven in Holland? 
No, Aristotle might consider him a rational human being for, for that, even though he wasn't very social for sitting in the oven. <laughs> but when he then went up to Sweden to teach the Queen of Sweden philosophy and caught a draft in the, in the, in the halls there in the palace in Sweden was very drafty and got pneumonia and died, then he wouldn't consider him. There, I think, therefore, I am. That's what Descartes said. It's in his book, The Meditations. See what you miss? Not studying philosophy. <laughs> no, the oven was off. But if he stayed in the oven, he wouldn't have frozen in the, to death in Sweden later on. Anyway, Descartes had this idea that the human being has two parts. It wasn't new with him. And that was that the human being has the soul, or the mind. See, that's the I who think, therefore I am, is the soul or the mind. And then there's the body. So he said the body is like a machine. Now, after Descartes, along came another guy in French philosophy named La Maitre. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention, Descartes also said that animals, see he rejected the idea of human being as a kind of animal, that animals, I'm sorry, human being is a kind of animal but an animal with a soul, but other animals don't have a soul. So other animals are like machines because their body, they, all they have is the body and the body is like a machine. And a machine doesn't have feeling. Now this, you see the moral implication immediately. This led to the practice of live vivisections, this is Descartes, live vivisections of animals for experiments, all based on Descartes' definition that animals are like don't, don't have souls because they're not human beings and therefore all they have is bodies and bodies are like machines and machines don't have feeling and therefore if you, you know, cut them up or even while they're alive they're not going to feel it because machines have no feeling. So there are moral implications to every definition like this. Now, then along came La Maitre. And La Maitre wrote a very famous book in the 17th century. I don't think you'll find it on the New York Times bestseller list now. But you can find it in English translation, he wrote it in French, called Man a Machine. So again, it's the mechanistic. Yeah, the mechanistic. And, and La Maitre said, look, Descartes told us the human being has two parts, the soul, or the mind, and the body. And the body's like a machine. But why should we assume that human beings have this mind. Why should we assume this? Maybe the mind is part of the body and it's also part of the machine. So La Maitre came up with the idea that human beings are machines. Man, a machine. That was the name of his book. So in his book he has to ask the ultimate question, the, the obvious question, which is what? No, now what's the purpose? How does from other right. How does the human machine differ from other machines? Procreate. No, other machines can re reproduce themselves too. Other machines can reproduce themselves. It thinks. No, he says it doesn't think. That's just the process it, it goes through. That's part of the machine stuff. He said, what machine reproduces? You've never been to a factory? It reproduces itself. It can reproduce itself. You never saw that movie? With the guy from India comes and makes the little robots? What's that movie called? Short Circuit. <laughs> sure machines reproduce. And he said, in this book, Man and Machine, 
The human being is different than other uh, machines. Human being is a machine, and it differs from other machines in that a human being is a machine that winds its own springs. They sound insane. In other words, you have clocks. They already told you they were big on clocks. Clocks in those days you had to wind every day. You know, today the kids in school, they have trouble telling time on a regular watch because they all have these digital things. So in those days you had to wind the, the clock. And the idea that a machine could wind itself was very strange. So, there I, so his idea was what differentiates the human machine from other machines is that the human machine winds itself up, feeds itself, in other words, gives itself energy, and other machines don't. That was his definition. Now, when you think about it, I don't know if you do think about it, but if you think about it, think about how many expressions we use in everyday language talking about ourselves and other people with comparisons to machines. Can you give me an example. He works like a machine. What? I mean, just that expression. I'm talking about in terms of your own behavior, what you're doing. Get started in the morning. Get started in the morning. Have a breakdown. Break wind yourself up, wind yourself down. Hmm. Any other? Your system. Talking about your doesn't fit my system or doesn't. Yep. Repair yourself something. Repair it. Charge your batteries. Charge your batteries. Let me give you some feedback. Feedback, input, output, throughput, <laughs> maintenance. So you have all kinds of terms. Turned on, turned off. Right? right? What do you mean by wind itself? <clears throat> what would, in relationship to man? He meant that the human being doesn't need an external force to start itself. Does a cow? Does a cow? Well, I don't know. He didn't write about cows. He would probably say that someone has to feed the cow and the human being can feed themselves. Look, if you meet him in the next world, you can ask him what he meant. <laughs> in his book, as far as I remember, he doesn't talk about cows. Now let me give you one other example. See how well you know Illinois history. You're exempted. You're in Indiana. You're exempted, too. Do you know the name Robert Ingersoll? What's this? No. Watch. There's a watch. There's a watch, Ingersoll, but this isn't that Ingersoll, as far as I know. I just received in the mail today an uh, announcement of the Ingersoll Award was being bestowed. So I didn't even know there was an Ingersoll Award named after this guy. If you lived in the 19th century, you'd all know who this guy was, because in the 19th century, he was the Secretary of State of the state of Illinois. So he would all be sending you your license plates. But that's not why he was well known, even though he was from Illinois and served as Secretary of State of Illinois. He was well known because in the 19th century, he was the most famous atheist in America. And he had many very great debates with all, I think, people like William Jennings Bryan and all these guys. And here's his definition of, of human beings. He says like this, man is a machine into which we put what we call food and produce what we call thought. Thought. Man is a machine into which we put what we call food and produce what we call thought. <coughs> Again, the idea of human being is a machine. 
or to give you another definition. I, I couldn't find it, who said it first, but it's a, a, it's a definition developed in the United States for sure. The human being is an ingenious array of portable plumbing. An ingenious array of portable plumbing. Now, you could say it's accurate, but would you like to think of yourself that way? And what are the implications of that definition? An ingenious array of portable plumbing. A trained dog is too. For lemma tray, for sure. But what, give me a, a more important implication. It leaves out the thought process. No, 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 no. I'm talking about a moral implication. But Don't be so philosophical. So wonderful, then you're less than a human being. Even a better one. You're, you're on the right track. Call, you're taking a thing we call humanity. Uh, you're making it very mechanical and something that can be used. Right, but give me a moral implication of it. Suppose it breaks. Suppose your plumbing in your house breaks. You throw it out. It's discardable. So if a human being is an ingenious array of portable plumbing, you get sick, who do you call? Plumber. Say again? For surgery a lot of implications for surgery, for sure. Well, he wasn't actually saying it was physically like plumbing. In a yes, he was. That's the whole point. Yes, he was. An imagery is sort of... A no, it's not an imagery. That's it. It's not only plumbing, it's portable plumbing. You're plumbing in your house, you can't take it out. Human being is portable plumbing. It's an absolutely good imagery for surgery. Because then you can just start pulling pieces and replacing them. Yes. There's nothing wrong with I have a friend who's a very, I won't mention who it is, but is a very famous um, surgeon. So I said to him once, he called up, and I said, he says, you sound upset. I said, I'm very upset. He says, why are you upset? I said, I'm having problem with my drain in the sink. So I told you, I'm can't, not too good with this. <laughs> No, I can put liquid plumber, that's about it. He said, I can't figure out how to unclog this, uh, this drain. He says, I'll be right over. So he comes over in two seconds, and like magic. He said, I said, how did you do this? He says, it's just like doing a bypass. Oh. Well, actually, it's, I mean, you really can get into a lot of the same type of tools. Right, <laughs> same principle. He says, I took this and I put it around this where the blockage was, and that's it. That's what, that's what was meant by, by Ingersoll. Right. That's it. And it's just like plumbing, but it isn't actually toilet plumbing. But it's plumbing problem. <laughs> or let me read, do you know who uh, Isaac Dennison was? The writer. Yeah. The writer. You saw the movie? Out of Africa. Out of Africa, right? This is what she wrote. What is man, when you come to think about him, but a minutely set, ingenious machine for turning with infinite artfulness the red wine of Shiraz into urine? <laughs> It's not a philosophical definition. This is a novelist. Let me make one more quote here, which doesn't have to do with the definition, but is relevant to the discussion. And that's from the early writings of Karl Marx. Karl Marx wrote, as machines become more like people, people will become more like machines. Did your experience? I'm glad. They have robots that do What do you mean they have cars to talk? Close the door. Close the door already. Would you please close the door? 
stupid, close the door. The car is talking to you, close the door. So we see problems with that definition. Hmm? Now, third approach. This is an approach that actually, I would say, Marx was writing against. And that was the approach that the human being is a kind of economical commodity. And the question then is, what kind of commodity is the human being and how it's differentiated from other commodities. Let me give you some examples. I applied once for membership in a very fancy private club. Guy calls up, we got your application. But there's one part you didn't fill out. I said, what part is that? It says, how much are you worth? I said, infinity. <laughs> Human life is infinite worth. He said, no, I mean, how much are you worth? I said, I just told you. No, I didn't. Actually, the club went bankrupt before. <laughs> Did you purposely admit that, or did you accidentally? I purposely admitted it, because if uh, net worth was a criteria, I knew I wouldn't uh, get in there. <laughs> now, let me read you one sentence that was sent. Why did you just assume it was economic? Why didn't you say 20 books? <laughs> because I knew it was economic, because I saw the form, and that's the part I didn't fill in, because they had after how much are you worth, where it all is. I thought you would only apply to more intellectual <laughs> It wasn't a very intellectual place, but it had a very good sauna. <laughs> and a very good dining room. <laughs> now, let me read you one sentence that was uh, in a memo sent in the 1940s. Um, from the headquarters of I.G. Farben. You know who I.G. Farben was? Yeah, they ran a little place in Poland. They ran a little place in Poland. Yeah, called? Auschwitz. Called Auschwitz. They, they actually owned, amongst other things, Auschwitz. They were the first international business cartel. Today, each of their div uh, former divisions is now bigger than the whole thing originally was. Pardon me? Well, the great irony is that when they bought Bantam Books, the first book they published was Gerald Green's book, Holocaust. I mean, that's really chutzpah. And they sent the, a direct a, a memo to the um, administrators of the auschwitz uh concentration camp. Auschwitz uh, had three camps. Auschwitz I, Auschwitz-Birkenau, which is two, and then auschwitz monowitz three, which was bombed. It's not even, there's no trace of it anymore, uh, which was the labor camp. So they sent it, this memo to the administrators of the labor camp, auschwitz monowitz All inmates must be fed, sheltered, and treated in such a way as to exploit them to the highest possible extent and at the lowest conceivable degree of expenditure. In other words, the people were the commodity. And then, in order to implement this directive, they had to figure out how much it was costing them to keep these people alive, how to get the maximum labor out of them for the minimal cost, which meant how to work them to death most efficiently. And so they put together some dietitians and some physicians and some nurses and some accountants, and they figured it out.
You see, the Nazi plan was to exterminate, kill all the Jews, right? So the question is, why then did they have labor camps? If the plan was to kill everybody, why didn't they just simply kill everybody? And the answer is that Auschwitz, as you heard, was owned by Farben. And Farben said, it's bad business. Here you have all of this raw labor, all these people you can work to death and make a lot of money out of. Why kill them? Why not work them to death? It's much more, much more cost effective. So they wanted to figure out a way of the most cost effective way to work people to death which they did, all on the assumption of the human being as a kind of economic uh, commodity. Now, I think you see problems with this approach based on all three uh, of our criteria. I hope so, right? Well, the laborers were not human beings by their definition. So, you don't have a definition that fell through like the other. Well, the definition falls through because the definition assumes that certain classes of human beings are not human beings. That's where the definition falls through. But not through, but that was a deliberate definition. The others, you found, you found examples where the definition within itself had people that would have, if there was a better definition, would have had, a more complete definition, would have had, would have included people like people who didn't speak Greek. Here, you had a deliberate, you had a deliberate definition which called the, the workers non-human. Right. So? So, um, how does the definition fall through? Yeah. Because you have this criteria of accurate, a, a definition that considers at the outset whole classes of human beings not to be human beings falls through a priori. Just like the speaking definition falls through a priori, or the Greek definition falls through a priori. Because if you're not a member of that group, Remember, it's one of the criteria, the first one was acceptable to you. You're not a Greek, you're not a, a, a Nazi, as far as I know. So, would these definitions be acceptable to you? No. Why? Because of the moral implications. You wouldn't come out too good. Has any definer ever cons worried or considered or thought that that third, your third criteria was, was relevant? With the third criteria of definition? Yeah. Oh, all of them. You mean like they all, that that's one of the most ignored? Yes, because they're at the, at the outset making a smaller circle here in terms of the class. They're only defining their in-group. They're not defining all human beings. It would be like when I define chairs, I only define, say, uh, thrones of kings. I don't history. define this as a chair. This is, no, it's a piece of junk from Sears, you know. So throughout history, people have been trying to define human beings in a restricted way. Some. The ones we're talking about. No, not really, because Le Maitre, all human beings are machines, not only French. Or Marx would say all human beings are treated as commodities, but they shouldn't be. That was Marx's whole business. And it treated the definition of himself, too, right? <coughs> Run that by me again? Well, this is the, for, these, for these philosophers, this was accurate because they have, this is how they define themselves, too. Well, when Aristotle says, for example, the human being is a rational animal, I mean, obviously, being a philosopher, it's a compliment for him, sure. It's totally acceptable to himself. What did Karl Marx say about the economic animal? that human beings are treated like commodities rather than like human beings. In other words, that human beings are defined by others than he, than by Marx, as commodities. And that's the whole problem of ex economic exploitation. So we see, I think, that all of these approaches, and we're talking here about approaches that have dominated Western thought for 3,000 years, 
have severe problems. They have problems, number one, in the criteria of definition itself. They have problems in terms of the moral implications of those definitions. And they have problems in terms of self-acceptability to individual people if applied to them. Now, what are the problems with these definitions beside the ones that we already discussed? I would say that all of these approaches commit what is called in philosophy the reductionalist fallacy. In other words, the attempt to reduce something with many facets, many aspects, in this case the human person, to one single facet. So you could say, yes, the human being is a, a kind of animal. Yes, that's true. But is that all the human being is? That may not be true. Secondly, none of these approaches assume necessarily the intrinsic value of the human being. And I would suggest that none of them consider the intrinsic value of the human being because none of them posit that there is a source beyond the human being that bestows intrinsic value and meaning on the human being. By source, I mean something like God, something like an objective source or guarantor of intrinsic value and sanctity of human worth. So now that we've sort of blown away 3,000 years of Western philosophy, the next question is, what is the Jewish view of all this? And I want to introduce sort of the, as Yogi Berra used, once said, before I say anything, let me tell you something. So before I, I give you what the Jewish view is, I want to set some, some groundwork. After I set the groundwork, we'll take a little break, and then I'll give you the Jewish view when you're a little more uh, refreshed. If you look in classical Jewish literature, let's say the first two strata of classical Jewish literature, the Bible and the Talmud, say the first 2,000 years of Jewish literature, what you find is that the approach to questions like what is the nature of the human being is not approached through definitions. In law, you have a lot of definitions. In Bible and Talmud as anywhere else. But in these kinds of questions, we say, what is the nature of the human being? They don't use definitions. For example, Socrates starts out the dialogue by saying, what is man? And then you have this whole business with the chicken. In the Psalms, in Psalm 8, you have a verse, Ma'adam, what is man? But the question isn't followed by a definition or even an answer. You know the rest of the verse? Yeah, what is man that you, God, are mindful of him? Did you think about him? In other words, it's a discussion of a relationship between human beings and the divine, not a question to which you expect a definition as an answer. So that I would suggest that in the classical Jewish literature, at least before you, until you get to medieval Jewish philosophy, in the, in, uh, after the biblical and rabbinic period, there is a tendency to reject the whole approach of definition. Because definition is too limiting, too exclusionary, too confining, and because it is too reductionalist. 
and therefore it does not posit things the way they really are. So what then do you find in classical Jewish literature, in classical Jewish thought? What you find is, number one, the tendency, rather than to define things, rather to describe things. And secondly, what you find is the tendency to describe things in terms of bipolar opposites. In other words, take for example God. Is God transcendent or imminent? Both. So these are polar opposites. Not this or this, because by definition, in definition, you can't have this and this. It has to be this or this. But this and this. Or for example, if Aristotle took this approach, he wouldn't have this problem defining women. Because if you have human being, it's not male or female, it's male and female. In other words, there are two varieties of human being, male and female. So you have everything defined in terms of polar opposites, complementary polar opposites, that the two op complementary opposites complement each other and together make a whole. You have, for example, the Hebrew word you all know, shalom, right? The root of shalom is Shalem. Shalem means to be complete. That's the goal. Completeness. Not this or that, but this and that. Rationality and emotion. Male and female. Transcendent and imminent. And in terms of the human being, that's the approach they use. Not a definition. They reject the approach of definition. A ra but rather a description of the human being in terms of two complementary polar opposites that together make up the whole, the composite. And it can be summed up, say, in two verses or two phrases from the Bible. One is, actually both are in Genesis, you have in the first chapter of Genesis that the human being is created what? Images. In the image and likeness of God. And then you have the verse about Adam and Eve, dust you are, and to dust you return. Or if you want uh, Abraham, the verse was a little more eloquent in Genesis, I think, chapter 18, when he says to God, I am dust and ashes. So you have this polarity between divinity or divine image and dust. Or you have that famous uh, rabbinic midrash that when God goes to create the human being, he says, Na'ase Adam. Now, Asa in Hebrew is the first person plural. Let us make man. Let us make human being. So the rabbis immediately said, what's this us? Let us. Who's us? So they make a midrash there and they say, well, God looked at the animals down below. They were already created. And he looked at the angels up above. And he said, let's, let us. In other words, let's make a being who has the polarity of the angel and the animal. So from this point of view, the zoologic approach is correct. Human beings are a kind of animal, but incomplete. Because there is the polarity of the human being between the animal and the angel, the dust and the divine. And that's uh, the approach. 
So in other words, you asked uh, what kind of definition would you find in Jewish uh, sources. What I'm suggesting is you don't find the definitional approach. It's a totally different way of thinking, totally different approach to things. To describe in terms of bi complementary bipolar opposites. All right, so on that happy note, we'll take a little break for 10 or 15 minutes, and then I'll show you how this idea develops through the tradition. All right, my original plan was to present the non-Jewish philosophical views then to take a break and then to present the Jewish view. And I decided not to do that that way, but to at least introduce the Jewish view first, not to leave you with the other views, because I thought of a story about the Hasidic master Rabbi Mendel of Kutsk. I think of these stories all the time. The story is, one of his followers came to him and asked him, should he uh, study Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed. So the rabbi of Kutz said, no, you shouldn't study it. So the chassid, the follower, said, why? So the rabbi of Kutz said like this. He said, look, when are you going to study it? All week you're working. You have no time. Then comes the Sabbath Friday night. You have dinner, big meal, get tired, you go to sleep. You wake up in the morning, you go to the synagogue. You come home from the synagogue, you have lunch, and then you have time to read. So you lie down on your couch and you start to read Maimonides' Guide of the Perplex. How does it work? First, Maimonides presents all the heretical views that he's going later to refute. So you start reading, and you finish reading all the heretical views, and by then you're so tired you fall asleep. You wake up, and it's time to go to the synagogue for the services ending the Sabbath. So you go to the synagogue, the Sabbath is over, then you go back to work. And here you're left only with the heretical views. You're not left with his refutation of the heretical views or of his views. So I didn't want you left with these other views, but I wanted at least to introduce the Jewish views, but there's a lot more. Let me give you now um, some more examples of this uh, polarity that you have uh, in the Jewish views. I mentioned that already in the Bible you have the beginning of the development of this polar view of the human being in terms of on the one side you have the human being as a animal, dust, something very low, and then on the other side something created in the image of God, a little lower than the angels, however you want to, whatever verse you want to quote, and together those two views give you a complementary, with an E, complement, a, a complemented view of human nature. This view is extended into the Talmudic writings. I'll give you one simple example. In the Talmud, in the tractate called Chagiga, if you want to look it up, it's on page uh, 16a, 16a, you have the following uh, text which in a bizarre way expresses this view. Here's the text. Six things have been said of human beings. In respect to three of these things, human beings are like the ministering angels, and in regard to three, they are like animals. So here you have the polarity, animals, angels. Right? Now, for the fun of it, take a guess. What, we'll take the easy one first. What are the three things the Talmud is, you think is going to list that human beings have in common with animals? Eating, procreation, and sleeping. 
Close. You got two out of three. So you only win the little lotto. <laughs> the third is excretion. <laughs> now, harder are the three things in common with angels. Thinking. Nope. Thinking. Thinking. They have understanding. No. Well, not speech. Yes, but not totally. Let's save this for a minute. Second one. This is the third one. Second one. Nope. Almost like Socrates' friend. They walk erect. That they have understanding. They walk erect. There's a famous uh, psychologist, Strauss, who had a whole theory of human nature is based on the fact that human beings walk erect. That's a whole other business. The third is they speak but according to the Talmud, they don't simply speak. They speak Hebrew. <laughs> so if you're taking a course in Hebrew, you know, you're taking really an angelology course. Now, in the 19th century, it was a Hasidic master, Rabbi Bunim of Shishcha. Don't ask me to spell it. I can spell it in Hebrew. I can't spell it in And he said, every person should have two pockets. And in each pocket, they should have a piece of paper. And on one piece of paper should be written the verse, I am created in the image of God. And the other piece of paper should be the verse, I am dust and ashes. And you pull out the paper as you need it. <laughs> so in other words, if, if you're too uh, haughty about something, you're too impressed with yourself, you pull out, I am dust and ashes. That deflates the bubble right away. But if, uh, say, your boss gives you a hard day at work, you're feeling lousy, you pull out the other paper. I am creating the image of God. Now, another polarity we have, which is developed by Maimonides and developed more recently by Heschel in the reading you had, is a polarity between the human being and being human. In other words, the human person is born as a human being. But the goal is to move from what is there potentially, potentiality, to actuality. In other words, by being human, you actualize human being. And in this view, moral behavior is how you attain the movement from potentiality to actuality. So say if you had somebody like uh, Hitler, he's a human being, but he's not being human. A second expression of this polarity you have in a very famous Talmudic text, which you find in the Babylonian Talmud, in uh, the Tractate Sanhedrin, page 37. There the question is raised, when God started creating human beings, why did he begin with only one? It would have been more uh, efficient, say, if he had started with a million. Why did he begin with only one? So that later there should be differences between, I mean, different kinds of human beings. Everybody can say that they are descended from this one human being. Right. There's That's not different kinds of human beings, just one kind of human being. 
world. That's one explanation. A test? You don't want to make a million if you don't know what they're going to tell. No, that's another midrash. That's another midrash. <laughs> this is a Talmud. We have the view expressed there that suppose, well, let me put it another way. They give an analogy there. You remember in the Roman times when this was written, they had those mints that they made coins from. You know, those things they put down in the metal and you'd have a coin. So the text there says, a minter takes a mint and makes an identical coin, many identical coins from the same mint. God takes the mint of the original human being, Adam, and from that makes many human beings, but every one is different. Then you have, a little before that, you have the discussion that if Adam had, say, died, he wouldn't have been replaceable. In other words, or when Cain killed Abel, Abel was not replaceable. Abel was unique. So you have here the idea of the human being as a unique form of being. And their conclusion in that Mishnaic text is because everybody is unique and irreplaceable, like Adam says, therefore, every person has the right to say, Bishvili Nivraha Olam. For me, the world was created. In other words, that every person is indispensable, irreplaceable, because they are unique. And therefore, every person is like Adam. Adam in Hebrew, Adam means human being. And therefore, everybody is allowed to say what Adam could say, because of me, or for my sake, the world was created. Then they have a discussion a little later in the text. But if everybody can say, because of me, the world was created, people will get haughty. So what do you do about it? So it says you do this. When God created the world, when, say, you create something, you usually do the most important things first. So God created the mosquitoes before human beings. So if a person becomes too haughty, you say, Yutush Kadamach. A mosquito was more important for God to think of creating before he thought of creating human beings. So here you have the polarity. Human beings are unique, indispensable, irreplaceable. And on the other hand, the mosquito God thought of creating first. Mosquito came before you. So again, you have the, the polarity. At certain occasions, you emphasize one side of the polarity over another. So we just finished, for example, the High Holidays. Which side of the polarity is emphasized in the liturgy in the High Holidays? Pardon me? Say again? Which side? The mosquito side, the dust side. Right? In that, the Unisanatokov prayer, Adam Yisodo Me'afar V'sofo La'afar. Man is from the dust and returns to the dust. Now, you have Another expression in the polarity, in the idea, which is called in Hebrew, the Yetzer Hatov and the Yetzer Hara. Usually translated, the good inclination and the evil inclination. If you read the reading from Schechter in the packet, you know all about this. I would prefer to translate Yetzer Hara not as the evil inclination, but rather as the inclination toward evil. Because it, as you'll see from some text that I'll adduce, it's not considered necessarily evil. In other words, that the human being is again a composite of complementary 
bipolar opposites, the inclination toward good and the inclination toward evil. They get this from a verse in Genesis uh, chapter 2, verse 7, where it says in Hebrew that God, Vayitzer et Adam, God created the human being. And there are two letters, Yud, in that word, which is unusual. Should be only one. So he said the reason there are two is because one refers to the Yetzer Hatov and one refers to the Yetzer Hara. That God created the human being not good, not evil, but both. Again, complementary. So in other words, you have a rejection here of the view that the human being is intrinsically bad. And you have here a rejection of the view that the human being is intrinsically good. What you have here is the view that they're both. Now the question is, what do you do with them? Now, Schechter brings you many texts. I don't want to repeat the many texts he brings. <coughs> But what is sort of surprising to many people when they read the rabbinic literature on these verses is that in the commentaries to Genesis 131, where it says, And God saw everything he had made, and it was very good. Earlier it says God saw what he made and it was good. But then at the end of the creation it says God saw everything he made and it was very good. They interpret like this. God saw everything he made, it was good. That's the Yetzer HaTov. It was good. Good inclination. But then, surprise, it says, God saw, uh, saw everything he made, and it was Tov Ma'od, very good. What does that refer to? Yetzer Hara. So how can that be? That the Yetzer Hara is very good? And then you have... Their comment in the Midrash called Genesis Rabbah in 9.7, it says, because if not for the Yetzer Hara, if not for the inclination toward evil, a person would not marry, build a house, beget a child, or engage in commerce. In other words, the Yetzer Hara is the drive that makes survival and creativity possible. Let me give you an example. It's not an example from any Jewish source, unless you consider Star Trek a Jewish source, for which I can make an argument. Of course I can do this. Now, what Star Trek I'm referring to it's the one in the original Star Trek. I don't know if you saw it, remember it. You know already which one I'm referring to? No, I remember that. Captain Kirk goes through this transporter, and out comes two Captain Kirks. One Captain Kirk is an all good, friendly, forgiving, wonderful Captain Kirk. And the other is, the, is a nasty, driven Captain Kirk. And they're both the same Captain Kirk, except two parts. One is the Yetzer HaTov, one is the Yetzer Hara. Now, the Yetzer Hara Captain Kirk is running around after the, the pretty female uh, crew people. So he is not really, doesn't really care the ship is under attack and might get, get blown up. He's too busy following his uh, inclinations. <laughs> and the good Captain Kirk is sitting on the bridge watching the ship being attacked and he's afraid to give an order to fire because it might hurt somebody. He might offend somebody. He can't make a decision. He has no survival instincts. So it's not until the last minute when they throw both of them into the, into the transporter mixer there <laughs> then put them back together that he can function as the captain because otherwise the ship would, would be destroyed. So in other words, the Yetzer HaTov, the good inclination is good because that has all of our good qualities. Try to help people, friendship, uh, altruism, stuff like this. 
But the Yetzirah Hara has all of our survival qualities and all of our creative qualities. And the human being can't function unless the two are together. The danger of the Yetzirah Hara is not when it becomes the inclination toward evil, but when it becomes evil. In other words, when the Yetzirah Hara completely takes over the person, that's when it becomes the evil inclination. But until then, it's tov mode. It's very good, because without it we couldn't survive. We wouldn't want to procreate. We wouldn't have any ambition. We wouldn't want to uh, survive. We wouldn't want to succeed. We wouldn't want to uh, make a mark on the world. There wouldn't be the possibility of choice. And here comes another text that you might find surprising. And this is found in the tractate Sukkah, which deals with the holiday we're in the middle of now, Sukkot, page 52a. Story is like this. This famous rabbi uh, is depressed. He's talking to his friend, his colleague. The colleague says, why are you depressed? So he says, I'm depressed because here's what happened to me. I saw this guy and this, this, this guy and this woman, young woman, and they were walking along in a beautiful meadow with a picnic basket and a very romantic scene so I decided to follow them because I wanted to see what was going to happen there. I wanted to see if he could control his Yetzir Hara. <laughs> Voyeuristic rabbi followed them and he noticed they went and sat down in the meadow. He was waiting for something to happen. They opened the picnic basket they eat within the pic picnic basket. They're lying on the ground. Beautiful day. It's waiting for something to happen. Nothing happens. They pack up the picnic basket. And they go home. And he follows them home, waiting every minute for something to happen. She goes into her house. He says, goodbye. Nothing happens. So his friend says to him, so why are you depressed? And he says, if I were that guy, you could bet something would have happened. <laughs> so he says, that's why you're depressed? He says, yeah, that's why I'm depressed. I shouldn't be like that. <laughs> and his friend says to him this nice quote, the greater the person, the greater their Yetzir Hara. In other words, the more creative the person, the more imaginative the person, they wouldn't be that creative and imaginative without the Yetzir Hara. And then the, the goal is to learn how to channel it to creative things. So Freud did not develop the idea of sublimation. You had it in a way already there. When does the Yetzirah Hara become dangerous is when it takes over everything. And the analogy they give is the Yetzirah Hara can be compared to a wayfarer who comes to you and says, can I stay, come to your house for dinner? You say, okay. Then after a while he says, can I stay overnight? You say, okay. Then he says, can I uh, be a boarder here? You say, okay. And then eventually, the, he, the boarder, who came for, you know, like that movie, the guy who came for dinner, is the owner, is the master of the house. So that's the problem of the Yetzir Hara. But if you learn how to 
have it work together with the Yetzer Hatov, and if you learn how to channel it, then you don't have that problem. Now, another, now let me return to the first polarity first. When we deal with the polarity between animal, angel, dust, and divinity, it's fairly clear what we're talking about when we mean dust and what we mean animal. Pretty clear. But what is not as clear, and someone asked this before, is when we talk about the human being in the image of God, as Tom Sawyer said to Huckleberry Finn, what do that mean? Huck, what does it mean, image of God? We say the human being is a composite between dust or animalness, or whatever you want to call it, and the image of God. What does image of God mean? Now, what we find in the history of Jewish literature is not one, but many interpretations of what that can mean. And I want to give you some examples of that. And I'm not saying that one is exclusive of the other. You can take them all and put them all together, and they're all uh, equally valid. And let's take a number of examples. When you have the story of the creation of the first human being in Genesis, chapter 1, what has God been doing until then? Creating. So what do we know about God until then? God is a creative being. So therefore, one possible explanation, or one possible interpretation of the term image of God could be that the human being is like God in the sense that the human being is a creative being. And we have this very nice phrase in the Talmud where the human being is called shutaf b'masebreshit, it's in the Talmud in the Trektate Shabbat, which means the partner of God in the work of creation. In other words, that the human being is a co-creator with God of the world. That God starts the process of creation and it's our job to, to finish the process. Now, I quoted to you before the verse from the Psalms, human being is a little lower than the angels. Not everybody agreed with that. Mm -hmm. There was, for example, a great Jewish mystic. See, I told you I'm technophobic, getting tangled up here. There was a great Jewish mystic in the 16th century in Prague, Rabbi Judah Lowe of Prague, known in his Hebrew by his acronym, the Maharal of Prague. And he discusses this question. And he comes to the conclusion that human beings are actually higher than the angels. Why? He says because angels have no free will. Angels are sort of programmed to do what they do. Human beings have free will. In other words, if an angel does something good, big deal. It's an angel. What else can he do? But if a human being does something good, considering all the temptations and the options and the choices, that's something. So Judah Lowe says, therefore, the human beings are really higher than the angels. My point here is that what we have in common with God is the idea that just as God has moral volition, so does the human being have moral volition, have free will. This was one of the great innovations of biblical thought. Those of you who have taken our course in Religion and Biblical Israel know that when you compare the Biblical thought to the ancient Near Eastern thought, the ancient Near Eastern thought is dominated by, by this idea that everything is determined by fate. That even the gods have no free will. Human beings certainly have no free will. 
But here you have the great innovation of biblical religion that God has moral volition, that not everything is predetermined, and that because God has uh, moral volition, the human being created in the image of God also has human volition. Third view, we already discussed, and this is the view that is developed by the medieval Jewish philosophers, not uh, unexpectedly, and that is the view that God is the ultimate rational being. And therefore, human beings created in the image of God are, let's not say rational beings, let's say intellectual beings. In other words, that human beings have intellect because they are created in the image of God. Now, if you take this view of the rational animal and say that's the only thing that the human being has, okay. But here, it's part of a composite of many other things. In the 19th century, there was a very famous Hasidic rabbi, some of you have heard of him, named Nachman of Bratzlaff. Any of you have heard of him? And he had a very unusual interpretation. He says, in this biblical verse, where the human being is created, says to create in the image of God, it also says the image and the likeness. The term for likeness in Hebrew is demut. In medieval Hebrew, medieval philosophical Hebrew in particular, there is the term koach hamadameh, which means the imaginative faculty, which comes from the same root as demut, which means image, which means likeness. This is the faculty, human faculty of imagination, of fantasy. And Nachman of Bratzlaff comes to the conclusion the thing we have in common with God is the ability to imagine or to fantasize. If you want, you can connect this with the, the creative, but you don't have to because there are different kinds of, of creativity. Now, I mentioned to you before this text in Sanhedrin 37a that stresses the idea of the uniqueness of the human being. The one verse from the Bible all Jews know, in Hebrew, if they don't know anything else, is the Shema, right? And the Shema says, God is what? One. one. The Hebrew word, Echad. But what does that mean, one? Maimonides' interpretation is it means one of a kind. In other words, if you say God is one, I could say this paper clip is one. But then if I have another paper clip, it's also one. So there's nothing special about it. But if I say God is one, Maimonides says I mean one of a kind. Or if, you'd say, if you studied logic, you would say God is a member of a class of which there are no other members. So if God is unique, one of a kind, then if human beings are created in the image of God, then they are, each of them is unique, one of a kind. And I would suggest that when we say human life is intrinsically holy, an idea that comes out of the Bible, though it's nowhere explicitly said there, the term for holy is kadosh, and the etymological source of kadosh is to be set apart. In other words, to be unique. From the uniqueness comes irreplaceable and indispensable. So here you have just a few possibilities as to what this other side of the polarity uh, might indicate. Now, another polarity altogether, which we haven't discussed, 
is the polarity between the soul and the body. Human being as soul and body. This distinction only comes later in Jewish thought. In the Bible, you don't really have it. And I can make a very good argument for the claim that in Biblical Hebrew, we have no term for body and no term for soul. The term goof, that means body in Hebrew today, is used in the Bible twice, but always in reference to a corpse, not to a living person. And the word that is very often, and in the King James English Bibles, was translated as soul, namely the Hebrew word nephesh, doesn't mean soul. I'll give you a proof text. You have the first verse in uh, Exodus. Jacob came to Egypt, and with him came 70 souls. So what, Jacob come, and flying behind him were 70 souls? It means 70 people. Even in English, you say souls, means people, right? So nephesh doesn't mean the soul is some kind of extracorporeal uh, entity. Nephesh means the person. Nephesh means the psycho-physical composite. In the rabbinic period, you begin to see a distinction made between the body and the soul. But still, the two are very, very close. So, for example, you have in the Tractate Sanhedrin, a little later than the text I quoted before, you have the following story about the relation of the body and the soul. They tell a story about a king, and the king had a vineyard. And he uh, hired two, one of his servants, hired two slaves to guard the vineyard. So even then, you'll see by the story, good help was hard to find. Because the, the servant hired two, two slaves to guard the vineyard, and one was blind, and one was lame. Not good for guards. So the, the king said to them, I want you to guard the vineyard. Don't let anybody eat the fruits of this tree. The tree is in the, in, the, in the vineyard. So these two guys are guarding the vineyard. And they get hungry. And there's this nice tree in the vineyard, and there's fruit on top of the tree. So the blind guy says to the lame guy, let's figure out some way of getting the fruit off the tree. We're both hungry. So the lame guy says, well, you can't see it, and I can't climb. What do we do? So one of them says, well, uh, I, the lame guy, I'll climb on your back, the blind guy. Or should I use politically correct language? The sight-challenged guy. <laughs> and will, and I'll go on your back and I'll pick the fruit. So that's what they do. And they eat all the fruit from the tree. And then the next day the king comes in the morning he sees all the fruit's gone. So he says to them, who ate the fruit? They say, don't look at us. I can't see it and he can't climb. So what did the king do? The king put the lame guy on the shoulders of the blind guy and he judged them that way. In other words, Talmud says, when the person dies, you have the body and the soul. And God wants to judge them for all their sins. So the body says, don't look at me. I'm just the body. I don't make decisions. I don't tell myself where to go. The soul does all that. So God turns to the soul, you do all that? He says, no, I didn't do all that. The body, he brought me everywhere. He took me everywhere. I couldn't have gotten anywhere without him. So what does God do? Puts the soul and body together and judges them that way. But in the later literature, beginning with the Amoraic literature, 3rd, 4th century, and going into the Middle Ages, where it really takes off, you begin to see a sharp distinction in Jewish literature between 
uh, the soul and the body to the point where they reach a, an, in some texts, an adversarial relationship. And once they reach an adversarial relationship where it's the soul not and the body, but the soul versus the body, the argument starts to run something like this. Lucky we sort of got out of this uh, mode. The soul is eternal. The body is transient. So which is more important? Soul. The soul. So if you have a choice between developing one or the other, which are you going to develop? The soul. If the body stands in the way of the soul, what are you going to do to prevent the body from corrupting the soul? You're going to repress it. And that leads to asceticism. And once you're led to asceticism, then you are led to a whole uh, view of what's moral and what's not moral. Luckily, this is not the only, this is a definite trend we have in Judaism. It's a myth to think we have no asceticism in Jewish history. We have a lot. Luckily, it never included celibacy. But. But this isn't the only trend we have. So I would say we have the following trends. You have this as a trend, the ascetic trend for sure, one trend. Then you have a second trend, which is the idea of the composite, that the soul and the body are a composite, a psychophysical uh, composite. This means that the body and the soul are interrelated. What you do to one affects what you do to another. And this is now becoming a very popular trend if you read Deepak Chopra and other contemporary gurus, and uh, even uh, gurus, or as Chopra says, guru, G, U, R, U. <laughs> of course, he says it with an Indian accent, which I can't do too well. Let me give you an example of this idea of the interrelation of the body and soul uh, in terms of moral issues already in uh, the 12th century. You find this in the writings of the great uh, Spanish Jewish poet and philosopher Ibn Gabirol in his book, uh, Improvement of the Moral Qualities. He says, everything that happens through your senses and therefore through the body affects you morally and the opposite because the body and soul are interwoven. So he says, for example, Gluttony. Gluttony means it's a moral vice of the soul. You see, for the medievals, you had the health of the body and you had the health of the soul. For them, morality, ethics, is the health of the soul. Moral virtue is like the health of the soul and moral vice is the illness of the soul. So just as there is a regimen for medical treatment, there is a regimen for treatment of the health of the soul. The regimen is to develop the moral virtues and to dispel the moral vices. So something like gluttony is a moral vice. But it's not simply something that affects the soul, it's obviously something that also affects the body. And it's something that for Gabiril is connected to the sense of taste. Or another example he gives connected to the sense of sight, which is part of the body, obviously, is acquisitiveness. Acquisitiveness he sees as a moral vice, but it's a moral vice that then affects the health of the body. Because if all you're doing all the time is worrying all the time how much more and more you can acquire, it's a stressful situation, you get sick. All right, so you have so far two views. The psychophysical unity, the soul and the body. The soul versus the body, that's the ascetic view. And then you have a third view, which is, I would call the view of temperance. In other words, this is a view that's not ascetic, but it's also against self-indulgence. And one expression of it, one of many, is the expression, say, of Maimonides, who on this comes close to Aristotle, when he advocates what's called the golden mean, or the middle path, 
the middle path between the uh, two extremes of behavior. So I'll give you an example. Uh, take something like food. You have on the one hand gluttony and on the other hand starvation. So neither are good. You want something in the middle. Or you have something like sexuality. On the one hand is uh, promiscuousness. On the other hand, say, is uh, abstinence. You want something in the middle. Now, one way in which this is expressed in Jewish uh, thought, and I think Martin Buber said it best, is the idea called the sanctification of the mundane. Taking that which is mundane, namely normal daily things you do, eating, sexuality, sleeping, uh, <coughs> uh, making a living, stuff like that, and you take what is mundane and you try to raise it to a higher uh, level of significance. And this leads to another idea about the image of God. And that is the idea called in Latin, I mean they didn't you'd say it in Latin, but there happens to be a nice Latin term for it, and you have an article about it, imitatio Dei, imitating the ways of God. Simply put, you have a verse in Leviticus, um, you shall be holy for I the Lord your God am holy. In other words, the goal is to be holy, to sanctify uh, life, to take mundane actions like eating and stuff like this and to make them holy. Why? Because God is already holy. Now let me make one other point and then try to uh, summarize, get to, uh, no, let me rephrase that. Let me make one more point and then sort of try to wrap this up. The other point which we will encounter throughout our uh, analysis of the different moral virtues is the question uh, which is debated throughout uh, not only Jewish literature but all of uh, Western uh, theological and philosophical literature in the Middle Ages in particular and that is is the moral the natural or is the moral the suppression of the natural now here we go back to where we started in other words every moral system assumes certain things about human nature human nature we've been discussing so far in terms of what is human about a human being but when you discuss human nature, you're discussing what is uh, natural to a human being. It assumes that certain things are natural to a human being. So when you raise the question, is ethics doing what is natural to the human being or suppressing what is natural to the human being, this already assumes you have some idea of what is natural to the human being. So for example, is gluttony natural to the human being? Is altruism natural to the human being? So if you would say gluttony, yes, is natural to the human being. I mean, left to his own devices. And altruism, say, is not natural to the human being. You would say that the answer is both. In other words, the answer is that ethics tries to develop certain of our natural inclinations and to suppress other of our natural inclinations and to channel still other of our natural inclinations. In other words, sexuality, for example, is natural. I'll say something I hope we all agree on. Sexuality is part of human nature. So, what do you do with it? One idea is you try to channel it into some way. 
In other words, you don't allow it to go to either extreme. You don't try to suppress it totally, that leads you to abstinence. You don't try to let it run wild, that can lead you to other trouble. You try rather to, to channel it. And what you find in Jewish sources is the idea of channeling it within an institution. That institution is the marital institution. But there are other options. Now, the final issue I want to bring to your attention, which I don't know if I'll have enough time to complete, at least to raise, because you raised it last time, and now I'm ready to discuss it. And that is, as we've seen, ethics rests upon a view of human nature. But it also rests upon views of the meaning of human existence. And we can't, and the reason I didn't answer the question before that you asked last time, is because you can't talk about the meaning of human existence until you first have an idea what is the nature of human existence of what kind of creature the human being is and of what can be expected of the human being. But once we have some idea of human nature, we can then turn to the issue of human meaning and then back to the question, which gets us back to the question we dealt with last time, which precipitated your question, and that is the question of why be moral. In other words, the issue now is, now that we have some understanding of how human nature is viewed in certain terms, the question then becomes why should a human being behave in a certain way? Therefore I suggest that the questions of human nature, human meaning, and the question of why be ethical are all intertwined. They're all really part of the same issue. And though it's much more complicated than I'll make it, I would suggest in Jewish religion, literature, and thought, we find the following ideas about why one should act in a certain way, in terms of why one should be ethical, in terms of what is the nature of the human being, and in terms of what is the meaning of human existence. I only have time now to present maybe one of these. So let me present the, the simplest one, which I would say is the biblical one. The biblical approach is a person should act in a certain way that the person's meaning in life draws and that human nature draws from certain relationships that we have. In the Bible, this relationship is characterized as the covenant between us and God. In other words, from the biblical point of view, why should a person be moral? Because we have a covenant with God. Because we have a relationship with God. And that relationship is expressed in that covenant. Why should I act toward a person in a certain way? Well, you should love your neighbor as yourself because I am the Lord your God. In other words, why should the person act in a certain way? Because God is there and because we have a relationship uh, with God. In other words, here you have the idea, as Heschel put it in the reading, I hope you did, that the human being and God have a kind of, of a covenant or he's, as he uses it, a partnership. Or if you want to put it in Buber's terms, there is what he called the I-thou, that there is a relationship, and that relationship gives meaning to human existence, that relationship gives direction to human morality, and that relationship, in this case, human being created in the divine image, gives the link between moral behavior and, and human nature. Now, this is simply one approach. Yeah, I have another minute, I can give you another one. I have about six or seven. The second one, I would say, let me give it to you in the most simplified form. In Yiddish, there is an expression, as pasnisht for a Yid. You know what that means? 
not proper for a Jew. It's not proper for a Jew. Jews don't behave this way. In other words, you remember in the first session I discussed with you that in Judaism, ethics is aesthetics. It's not aesthetic to behave in a certain way. It's not proper, not befitting to behave in a certain way. It's, it's, it's offensive. In other words, why should a person be moral? Because that's the way it is. That's the way we behave. I mean, you say to a little kid, you know, who's doing some kind of stupid prank or something like this, don't act that way, it's disgusting. And he says, no, it's not, you know. And you say, big boys don't act that way. It's, 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 it's not aesthetic. So in other words, why do we act in a certain way? Because it's aesthetic. Why don't we act in a certain way? It's not aesthetic. So for Jewish ethics, Jews just don't act this way. That's a simple, simple thing. I'll give you a third thing that's even simpler. And that's the, essentially the Talmudic view. Essentially the Talmudic view is that we have a system of commandments. God is the commander, we have a system of commandments. And we should act in a certain way because we are commanded to act that way. In one of Heschel's writings there, he makes a play on words, on De, uh, a pun on Descartes. Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. He says, you are commanded, therefore you are. In other words, this is how God wants you to live. So, a person should live this way. And then, since you're already patient, you have a fourth. We should act a certain way because we are created in the divine image. And acting in a certain way acts out what that image is. And depending on how you see that image depends on uh, how your activity uh, is. Let me just mention the fifth, I won't get into it now, because I already touched on it before, and that is the movement from potentiality to actuality. Mor moral behavior is the way to move, to realize human potential, to actualize human potential. That every person's job, every person's purpose in existence is to move to realize their potential, whatever it is. And their potential is to become as wholly human, or as truly human, or as completely human as they can. And the development of the moral qualities or as I wrote about it, called, I called it life as an art form, that's how you make that movement from human actuality to human potentiality, from human being to being human. So that's why be moral. And that's, in this view, the meaning of life, to create life as an art form, to move from potentiality to actuality. And that's based on a notion of the nature of the human being, that the human being is essentially a creative being, like God is a creative being, and the greatest thing we have to create the greatest work of art we can create is our own life. So on that happy note, I will bid you a good night.